Hello, I hope you are having a great day so far and I hope you enjoy reInvent this year. My name is Prarthana Karmakar and I am a software development manager here in AWS. With me today we have Mark, he is a senior principal engineer in AWS. We have been thinking about storage and virtualization at AWS for the last several years now. Today, we are going to talk a bit about EBS and dive into some of the technology behind Block Express, our new SAN in the cloud offering. But before we get started, let's take a look at where EBS fits into the AWS storage portfolio. AWS offers three main types of storage, object, block, and file. And we also offer a range of options for backup storage. These solutions are designed to provide cloud scale, low cost, secure storage, but with different interfaces to meet the needs of your applications. In this session, we are talking about block storage. Block storage is found in all kinds of computing and mobile devices. Practically anything that has a local storage has something like a hard drive or a SSD where data can be written, usually via, via a file system, to help keep everything organized. Block storage differs from object and file in that it does not rely on metadata for storage and retrieval, so that read and write times are really fast. For EC2 instances, you have the choice of either local instance storage or EBS. You can think of local instance storage as a raw disk protected by the security of our Nitro controllers, directly attached to your instance. Now, what is Amazon EBS? Amazon Elastic Block Store provides raw block level storage that can be attached to Amazon EC2 instances. Instance storage is a raw disk, while EBS is a large distributed system that provides high performance, is highly available and highly durable block storage that can, can be connected over the network to any EC2 instance and is designed for most workloads at any scale. The most important thing to remember is that an EBS block device or what we call the EBS volume is not just a disk. As you will see in a bit, we built EBS to allow us to continuously deliver new features and new functionalities. When you have an EBS volume, what can you do with it? EBS volumes can be attached to an EBS EC2 instance in the same availability zone, and it appears in your instance just like any other disk. You can create a file system or write data from your EC2 instance on the EBS volume, and the volume can be persistent, storing your data even when it is disconnected from your instance. EBS volumes can have the performance characteristics similar to what you would expect from your local SSD or a hard drive. Now within those families, we offer a variety of volume types with different performance, price and durability characteristics designed to match the needs of any applications that you run in AWS. All the management of EBS volumes, including lifecycle features, such as creating and deleting, or even changing the type or performance characteristics online is available via the tool that you are most familiar and comfortable with, whether it's the AWS APIs, the AWS SDK, or the AWS console. And with all volumes, you can take point-in-time snapshots of these volumes for retention and recovery. We launched EBS 13 years ago in 2008, and today it is used by millions of developers to store exabyte of data across millions of EBS volumes, driving trillions of IO operations every day. In that time, we have come to understand what customers care about, care about most when using block storage in the cloud. Customers value high performance for their most resource intensive applications. This means high IOPS and throughput. So a volume like IO2 is built to scale to 64,000 IOPS and 1,000 megabytes per second of throughput. But it also means that IO needs to be fast and consistent. So our SSD volumes like GP2, GP3, IO1, and IO2 
are built to deliver average single digit millisecond latency while our new block express architecture and the io2 block express volumes are designed to deliver sub millisecond latency reliability is important to our customers customers want to get their data when they want it and they want the data to be safe ebs volumes offer 99.999% availability and afr as low as 0.001% on the io2 volume customers want their block storage to easily grow as their applications grow whether second over second or year over year individual ebs volume scales from a single gigabyte to up to 64 terabytes and you can have petabytes of total storage supporting everything from massive enterprise databases to pods of hundreds of short lived stateful containers tools like elastic volumes allow you to switch between volume types increase storage and the right size performance making ebs easy to manage and scale with your business other tools like ebs data life cycle manager make it easy to set up the backup schedules and the retention policies for your volumes of course your data must stay secure and ebs supports aes 256 encryption that is as simple as clicking a box or as advanced as a self managed kms keys ebs encryption has no impact to performance and there is really no reason why you shouldn't enable it to secure your data in fact with a simple click you can enable it by default for all new volumes in your account and like all aws services ebs does all of this to provide the absolute best value for their money to the customers with cost effective pricing that scales only as your workload and your usage scales These six areas are what we hear most from our customers. So these are the areas that we have thought a lot and put our most innovation in here in EBS. You can see that focus in features and capabilities we have delivered since we launched. Back back then, we offered only one volume type and the ability to snapshot the volume to S3 for backup. That first volume type, now called standard. was backed by hard disk drives it offered up to 1 terabyte of storage with no performance guarantees since then we have expanded our volume offerings quite a bit the provisioned iops io1 volume was our first ssd volume then came a lo- lower cost ssd option gp2 and now we have gp3 offered at even lower cost and better performance We also build the lower cost hard drive volumes ST1 for cold streaming workloads and ST1 for higher throughput streaming workloads. And of course, our recent volume launch IO2 offering higher IOPS per gigabyte and lower AFR than any other EBS volumes. Around these volumes, we have included a lot of new features that our customers care about. It is not possible for me to walk you through all the new features we added in one single slide. But we continue to deliver new features and new functionalities to provide our customers with value every day. These volumes are good for a number of workloads. You all have different types of workloads. We are going to walk you through a couple of different broad categories to help you understand what what fits um, in these categories and also to recognize that not all, all workloads will fit into this nice and neat little boxes so one of the things that ebs enables is the ability to pick and choose and now i'll walk you through how to do that ebs has two main families of volume types today we have our ssd backed volume types and we have our hard drive backed volume type on the ssd side we have gp3 which is our general purpose volume and our io2 volumes which runs on ebs block express architecture and then our hard drive products sc1 and st1 are available as well 
Now, which ones do you choose? Let's start with the database workloads. This is a lot of what we see. Most applications have some sort of data stored behind them. This is typically where our performance requirements come into play. Mostly random IO, most databases, even if they are NoSQL or SQL based, have a write ahead log or journal that is mostly sequential. But the real application pattern is, is highly workload dependent. What it means is that what your customers are doing drives the requirements of your databases. Typically, we see that customers have the best experience with SSD volumes here. But sometimes the hard drive backed products also work well. Now let's dive a little deeper into the SSD backed products. I start with GP3. This is a volume type we spent a lot of time with. Analyzing the data, analyzing the patterns, analyzing the workloads, and we developed it to achieve the sweet performance spot for 70 to 80 percent of all workloads. GP3 satisfies nearly all workloads. Designed to be a truly general purpose volume, actually that is why we gave it the name of general purpose. So if you don't know which volume type to use, I highly recommend that you start with GP3. Additionally, you have the ability to provision more IOPS and more throughput when you need it without being dependent on the storage size. GP3 is designed to provide a predictable 3000 IOPS baseline performance and 125 megabytes per second regardless of the volume size. Customers looking for higher performance can scale up to 16,000 IOPS and 1,000 megabytes, megabytes per second of throughput for an additional fee. You can provision these volumes from 1 gigabyte all the way up to 16 terabyte. A single digit millisecond latency makes GP3 ideal for all latency sensitive interactive applications, boot volumes, dev or test environments, Bursty databases, just about anything really. Continuing in the path of innovation, last month we announced the general availability of our highest performance volume ever, the IO2 Block Express. We have been working for several years now on a series of foundational changes here in EBS. This includes building a new storage fabric based on the SRD networking protocol optimizing our instance data path with Nitro and completely rethinking our storage hardware design. The result of that hard work is the architecture we now call Block Express. IO2 Block Express volumes offer four times the performance of IO1, up to 256,000 IOPS, 4,000 megabytes per second of throughput. And you can provision up to, up to four times more storage up to 64 terabytes. And perhaps most important for your demanding applications, it will offer this baseline, this high performance numbers at an average sub millisecond latency, the first ever volume type to do so. Now what exactly are mission critical applications? If you answered yes to the question in the previous slide, then your application workloads are critical. Otherwise, they are not. Now moving on to media. So this is your rendering farms, the transcoding, encoding, and any sort of streaming product. If uh, here you typically have a higher throughput requirements, mostly sequential and pretty sustained, especially when, he, when you have a pretty substantial rendering jobs. For these kinds of workloads, our throughput optimized product ST1 might be a good fit. ST1 is our throughput provision volume type. The baseline performance scales with the size of the volume. Here, instead of measuring in IOPS, we are talking about throughput in megabytes per second. Baseline is 40 megabytes per second per terabyte provision up to 500 megabytes per second. The burst is designed to allow you to scan, scan the entire LBA range a few times a day. 
you get that up to 500 megabytes per second. These are not designed for boot volumes and you have a minimum capacity of 125 gigabyte, gigabytes. But you can scale it up to 16 terabytes. And on the logical merge, and what I mean here by logical merge is that we don't actually hold on to your I.O. and wait for the next one to come in before we complete it. We just keep track of where it was and if the next one looks like it was in the same place or sequential or the next LBA range over, then we count it as the previous I.O. These are good for large block high throughput sequential workloads. Data analytics. Now this is a common application. You have got log analytics that you want to do, Kafka, Splunk, Hadoop, or maybe data warehousing with different types of data access patterns. Typically, these are higher throughput requirements, usually sequential IO, but not really sustained applications. There might be some daily, hourly, or weekly periodicity to it. These are good for our HDD products, either SC1 or ST1. SC1 is a little bit colder. Similar to the characteristics of ST1, but the performance are a bit more modest, are our SC1 volumes. This is designed for one complete scan a day. So the baseline throughput is lower, burst throughput is low, but it also comes with a lower cost. So what you trade performance for cost. Everything else is similar to our ST1 product. So you got the one megabyte of logical merge and capacity can range from 125 gigabyte to 16 terabyte. These are ideal for large sequential workloads, but maybe something you're not doing full volume scans. Use cases include sequential workloads, including such as backup and logging. Now, file sharing is another very common workload. This could also be a web server and things like CIFS, NFS, or this could be the nearline archive. Oftentimes, these are low, super low throughput, very bursty, unpredictable, but when that happens, there is often not a lot of traffic that goes on. And you are designing this with cost sensitivity in mind. So for this workload, SC1 is a super compelling product. Now, EBS allows you to mix and match your volume types. You can take an instance and you can attach any different number of volumes of any size and performance characteristics and really fine tune what your application is doing. You can use elastic volume to change your volume types and add or modify the performance characteristics that your applications might need. With the inclusion of IO2 Block Express, you can see from the previous slides, from a slide from that I presented before, that the performance curve extends quite a lot from before. Now let's slide, dive a little deeper into that. EBS scales as your applications grow and you only pay for what you use without any long-term commitments. So now you can start to move those applications from on-prem into AWS and you start to apply the benefits of the cloud economics even where your performance needs are the highest. When your application or data needs change, you can easily modify the performance or your storage type. EBS SAN in the cloud performance is now on par with the performance of the mid-range SAN in your data center. But you get that performance without having to buy and manage a SAN and the complex infrastructure management that comes with the, with the SAN in, in your data centers. And with AWS's constant innovation, you also no longer have to deal with the hardware refreshes cycle just to get the latest features and performance. Mark will dive a lot deeper into this and walk through the details. Thanks, Prathana. Let's dive a bit deeper into SAN in the cloud and how we've evolved our architecture to make it possible. As Parthena mentioned, there are six areas where we focused on SAN in the cloud. We're going to dive into three of those areas, starting with reliability. The EBS SAN in the cloud architecture offers reliability for mission-critical applications. 
Each IO2 volume is designed to protect against failures by replicating within the availability zone, offering 99.999% availability and an annual failure rate of 0.001%. That's five nines of durability. For simple and robust backup, you can use EBS snapshots combined with Amazon Data Lifecycle Manager policies to automate your snapshot management. EBS thinks about volume reliability in two ways. We define availability as the ability to access your data, and that typically accounts for our network and uptime of our service. Availability also includes the ability to manage volume and snapshot life cycles, such as create volume, attach volume, etc. EBS is designed for five nines of availability. We track this continuously and set alarms at aggressive levels to ensure we meet our design goals. The second thing we think about is durability, or the ability to get your data off the media. EBS has up to five nines of durability. This is significantly more than a typical disk, which has approximately a 4% failure rate. The way to think about this is if you have 100,000 volumes across a year, you should plan for one of these to fail. Let's take a look at how we've evolved our control plane in design to achieve this availability level. We like to think about the EBS service in two broad segments. First is the data plane. The data plane is the part that touches your bytes, whether that's the EBS volume itself, the storage server hosting those volumes, the network, and the, the EC2 host that hosts your instance. Everything else that manages that infrastructure is called our control plane. And EBS really has several different control planes, as we'll talk about in a minute. EBS began its journey, however, with a single monolithic control plane that was responsible for all volumes in a region. We called this control plane storage manager. As we've explored our architecture, we recognized that the availability of existing volumes was important. We took the first step towards a smaller blast radius by creating a new service called the Configuration Manager. The Configuration Manager stores the map of volume to host so that we know where EBS volumes live within our storage infrastructure. And it's critical to how EBS volumes are attached and managed to your EC2 instance. When we created this service, we focused on reducing dependencies and interactions and wanted to build the availability zone as the largest thing that could be impacted by any failure. The configuration manager plays a key role in attachment and repair of EBS volumes. And different volume types have different replication strategies, depending on their durability and availability requirements. The configuration manager is responsible for storing all this information. Because of this, we knew we needed a highly durable and highly available service so we built it based on Paxos replication. As we operated this new configuration manager service, we were happy with the improved scaling and blast radi radius reduction properties of moving it to be an availability zone service. We decided that it would be a good idea to move the rest of the control plane. Now, when we did this, we could have taken the, the storage manager and stamped out a storage manager in each availability zone. But instead, we took the opportunity to reevaluate our strategy and began to think of a service-oriented architecture. By separating the functions of storage manager into smaller services, this was before the term microservices had really been, become popular, we were able to be more efficient, not just whole scale scaling everything, but by only scaling out the components as required. It's not only compute resources, but also developers that have become more efficient due to this they can focus more deeply on their specific service instead of thinking about the entire control plane. It's important to note, we already had developers specializing in some areas anyway. So this was a natural extension of the way that we organized our, our, our system. AWS availability zones have grown to be tens of data centers. As we scaled, even a configuration manager for an availability zone was too big. So we set out to create even smaller boundaries. We asked, what's the smallest blast radius we could have? We made a key observation. Instead of a typical database where every client needs all the data, we recognized that each client had a small and specific amount of information. And we coined a new term called a cell. Now in the case of EBS volumes in the configuration manager, the clients are mainly the EC2 instance that is attached to your volume and the storage servers hosting your volume. A cell is the smallest unit of failure that we think about in AWS. Different services and different components have different cell sizes. For the configuration manager, we wanted the cell to be as small as possible. Question was, how small could we get? 
We knew that by constraining the data in the database, we could reduce the blast radius. We found that we could build a database for each individual volume, and this led to Fazelia and millions of tiny databases. The only clients required are the storage servers, the EC2 instances, and the volume itself. We built each cell as a seven node Paxos cluster and are able to distribute the nodes both near the clients for availability purposes, and we ensure that we keep a couple of those nodes in neighboring locations for durability. Now, as we scale to millions of databases, there's an obvious challenge here. How do you manage a million things? Typically, when you first build a system, you might build it with some human interaction required. And then as you scale, you build in more and more automation. With millions of databases, we had to build automation into the initial design. In fact, much of the automation that we have today was built before the first cell was even tested. Now on the data plane, we design our systems to recover from failure with as little human and control plane interaction as possible. Whether it's a network partition or a larger scale power outage, we've built our systems with static stability or the ability to recover to a steady state in mind and are continuously improving our ability to recover quickly. As with any type of storage, we encourage our customers to have a robust, secure backup strategy in place to secure their data. EBS offers a fully managed backup tool built in with EBS snapshots. Snapshots are point-in-time copies of your data that are stored in Amazon S3. They can be used to restore to an earlier time in the event of, say, an incorrect configuration change. Maybe you want to scale out your service by just instantiating new volumes from a point in time, or copy those volumes across availability zones. When a new volume is created, you can choose to create it based on an existing snapshot. In that scenario, the new volume begins as an exact replica of the original volume at the time the snapshot was taken. Snapshots give you immediate access to EBS volume data, and you can also share EBS snapshots and copy those snapshots across AWS regions. Snapshot functionality allows you to have geographic protection of your data and enables you to achieve business continuity for your organization. Let's go through a few of the ways that you can leverage the features of snapshots to improve your operations on EBS. It's always important to keep track of your data. One of the ways that's common through most AWS services is via the use of tags, and snapshots really are no different. You can tag a snapshot at any time, but we recommend that you tag them on creation to help you keep track of them. Oftentimes, customers use multiple tags to help with things like source and retention policies. EBS snapshots even supports the ability to leverage tags for cost allocation. So you can accurately track snapshot usage by dev versus test, or even by business unit or cost center. Additionally, you can create IAM policies based on tagging to restrict access and usage of commands like create snapshot, delete snapshot, and modify snapshot. While we're on the topic of security, we mentioned this before, but I wanna say it again. If you take a snapshot of an encrypted volume, that data will always remain encrypted, and that includes the snapshot. But what about those older snapshots that weren't encrypted? You can use the copy snapshot functionality to also encrypt a snapshot, either in the same region or when you copy to another region. Another powerful feature of snapshots that we've seen a lot of customers make use of is sharing. It's a best practice to create AWS accounts that are just for your production workload. These accounts should be isolated and follow a pattern of least access. With snapshot sharing, you can create snapshots of your production workload and share them Carefully, of course, with your dev and test environments if you need to use them for load testing or other investigations. We've also seen customers build things like an AMI factory that then shares production AMIs with the rest of their accounts. Let's move on a bit to performance. So when we think about AWS SAN in the cloud, what are the target workloads? Well, the answer is everything that you run currently today in your on-premises mid-range SAN. These are typically the most demanding applications that form the foundation of your business. Things like mission-critical deployments of Oracle, SAP HANA, Microsoft SQL, really anything that requires high durability, high IOPS, and low latency are good candidates. Where previously you may have had to stripe multiple IO2 volumes together to get performance, with IO2 Block Express, you can now get the performance with a single volume. Now we use the term IOPS and latency and throughput, and these are things that we talk a lot about when it comes to, to storage performance. But what do they actually mean? And how do you figure out more details about your workload? On Linux, you can use the IOSTAT tool. With the command here, the first line output is total since boot. 
and each following output is a change over the previous five seconds. Here I've cut it down to one of those change lines. You can see that your application is driving almost 25,000 reads per second, totaling almost 1,000 megabytes per second. If we do the math out, you can see that it's an average request size of 40 kilobytes. Now the application also has a small amount of writes, just over 1,500 per second, totaling 6 megabytes. If you do the math on these, it's 4K writes. And so we can look at it all up in aggregate and notice that over the past 5 seconds, between those two, the I.O. averages out to 78 sectors, or just over 39 kilobytes. Looks to me like this workload is mostly medium-sized reads. Averages are nice to have, and they give you an idea of what your workload's doing, but they don't tell the story, whether it's in size or performance or really anything. Linux has an advanced tool called Block Trace available. Here I leverage Block Trace to capture five minutes of data on a similar workload. Then I use the built-in block parse and BTT tools, which will parse those binary files down into traces that are, that are more easily managed. I wrote a Python script, which I'll show on the next slide, to parse those traces down. Now in the core of this, this script, what I do is I, for every line that's in that trace file, I capture the start offset, the ending offset, as well as the size of that IO. And the reason I capture the offsets is to ensure and make a determination on whether it's a random workload or a sequential workload. And so that capture that I did, we can look at this and we see that it was mostly a random read, so very little sequentiality among the IOs, with two main IO sizes, somewhere around 16 kilobytes and 64 kilobytes, with some in between. On the right side, it's a completely different story and very similar to the IO stat that I showed you. You've got 4K sequential writes this looks a lot like a database, really, doing random table reads and sequential log writes. When EBS launched 13 years ago, we started with a storage fabric that relied on a TCP transport layer. I won't dive into TCP today, but many technologies, such as the web browser that you typically use, are built on top of it. It offers reliable delivery of data and handles transitioning between different network speeds and can also manage congestion events. It really is a jack-of-all-trades transport. But that's the problem. It does a lot of things really well. But as we scaled our data center networks and EC2 instance and EBS volume performance, we found places where TCP starts to struggle and has difficulty in our environment. When EBS first launched, an EBS volume was contained on a pair of servers. Today, EBS volumes are sharded across many servers with varying replication strategies depending on the requirements of the volume. One of the challenges of sharding is when there are simultaneous read requests to multiple shards. Each server can return their data at the same time, causing a microburst in the network at the last mile. And the last mile is the link between the EC2 host and the switch that it's connected to in our network. This microburst event causes more data than the link can actually process, and it's a phenomenon called incast. This synchronized contention causes a significant throughput collapse in TCP-based protocols. By adjusting the congestion control algorithms and other properties within our storage fabric, we were able to drive more throughput to your instance. And, but really, it only delayed the onset of this congestion event. A few other things that TCP caused us challenges with is it's difficult to offload in hardware. So as we moved into more hardware-based offload designs, it required more real estate on the chips. And in other failure events, it's also slower to recover. Faced with these challenges, we took a step back and started to think about our storage fabric and how we would build a next generation fabric. When we took a look at our data center networks, our data centers are built with a tremendous amount of network capability and are relatively flat to ensure good latency. There are many paths between any two endpoints. Now these paths exist for both capacity and for the ability to quickly route around failures. As we thought about storage, we recognized that while the data for an IO needed to arrive in any order, any outstanding IOs could be reordered relative to each other. To ensure data consistency, we serialized data within our storage durability engine. We didn't need our network protocol to, to have an additional serialization layer on top of that in order to ensure data correctness. With these requirements in mind, we started working with a few other teams within AWS 
and built our next generation storage fabric, built on top of SRD. What is SRD? SRD, or Scalable Reliable Datagram, is a transport protocol that incorporates AWS's experience operating extreme workloads at cloud scale, using our large network as an advantage to deliver even higher throughput and lower latency to our customers. Specific to EBS, in-flight IOs are able to take advantage of the multi-path capabilities within our network. Each outstanding IO can take a different path through the network, quickly routing around congestion and failure. Because we no longer serialize in the transport, a single bad path will no longer prevent all IOs from continuing. Any IOs sent along the failed path will aggressively be retried on other paths. The congestion control algorithms are also able to consider each IO individually, more quickly responding to and recovering from in-cast style events, making them no longer an issue in our infrastructure. When we introduced the Nitro card for EBS with C4 instances in 2015, we were finally able to offload our storage functions into hardware. In C4, the Nitro card exposed NVMe to the hypervisor, in this case Zen, which then used a pair virtual driver to expose this, the EBS volume to the guest. We chose this method mainly due to the stability of NVMe drivers in most guests. With the first Nitro controller, we were able to offload all EBS volume encryption and hardware, that is, and this hardware is capable of full speed encryption. Not only does this improve performance, making encrypted volumes performance equal to unencrypted volumes, but it also improves security. With Nitro encryption, EBS volume keys are no longer resident in the hypervisor and only available to the hardware engine itself. We were also able to offer EBS optimized, which is a reserved network just for storage by default. Over time, the NVMe drivers have improved in both Linux and BSD. And we built an add-on driver for Windows instances that also improves the capabilities of the native driver. With these enhancements in our Nitro instances, we're able to expose NVMe directly to your instance, removing yet another source of jitter and performance impact to the hypervisor from your storage experience. Each generation of Nitro controller adds additional capabilities and performance. Taking advantage of this, last year we launched the R5B instance family, the first instance designed for high-performance storage-bound workloads. This instance family has the same vCPU to memory ratio as R5, but it includes more than three times the EBS optimized performance, up to 260,000 IOPS and 7,500 megabytes per second of throughput. This was the first instance to take advantage of our new storage fabric, which is one of the foundational components of SAN in the cloud. We expect to bring this new fabric to even more Nitro instances soon. We launched EBS. When we launched EBS, we had a small number of code repositories for the entire service. I could actually count them on a single hand. When we moved to a services-based architecture and our control plane, that number expanded greatly. We found that with all these repos, we were actually able to scale more easily. But not only that, we could move quicker and add new features and functionalities as well. Recently, we started to wonder if we could be successful applying some of the things we learned and taking them and applying them to a high performance data plane. Now, this is typically a challenging prospect. With most data planes, you're counting cycles, thinking about the impact of every operation and every thing, piece of code that you do. Decoupling or moving functionality across code boundaries tends to create overhead due to the requirements of API servicing. As we started exploring the space, a few things really started to come to light. First, it caused us to think deeply and critically about what needed to be in the core fast path. We wanted only the absolute minimum functionality between pulling an IO off of the network and committing it to durable media. We noticed that over time, we had built some extra processing into the fast path that maybe didn't need to be there. Removing this asynchronous functionality allowed us to build an even tighter and faster durability engine. Second, as we started building, we recognized that not only was our code and thus our system faster, we were able to reason more about the correctness and security properties of it. While this isn't a talk about formal methods, I will point out that it's easier to model your components in tools like TLA plus or P if they're more compact, leading to stronger trust in your algorithms. When you're able to define API boundaries between functionality, it's easier to have teams focus on the code within that API boundary. 
on a data plane, it's no different than what we saw on a control plane. And we've seen this ownership actually improve our product. The result of this effort is what we call Block Express, which we launched in preview last year, but is generally available just a little bit ago. We also took the opportunity, at the same time we were launching Block Express, to reevaluate our hardware designs. In our newfound agility and scale abil scaling ability within the data plane, allowed us to build new hardware designs to deliver a more consistent and higher performance EBS storage engine. The question is, how much more consistent? Well, let me show you. I did a comparison of two volumes, IO1 on our previous architecture and IO2 on Block Express, connected to the same EC2 instance. The graph is a CDF, or a cumulative distribution function. I used a test that had 16 kilobyte write IOs, and this records latency across the entirety of the test. The left-hand side of the graph is the minimum observed latency as seen from the instance in my test in microseconds. Even at the lowest end, we already see the, the benefits and differences of IO2 Block Express. As we move to the right and into higher percentiles, the IO1 volume has a higher slope or faster increasing latencies when compared to the IO2 Block Express volume. The knee, or where the slope dramatically changes, is also at a lower percentile, or shifted further to the left, than the Block Express volume. IO2 Block Express maintains its sub-millisecond latency well into the high percentiles. IO2 Block Express, together with R5B instances, all built on top of the SRD storage fabric, give you the performance of a SAN in the cloud with the power of the AWS pay-as-you-go pricing model, and without any of the headaches. The most important things are, thing our customers are is concerned about is security. EBS prioritizes security first. EBS volumes support encryption of data at rest, data in transit, and all volume backups. EBS encryption is supported by all volume types. It's integrated with KMS, and with our investment in the Nitro architecture, there will be no impact on performance. Finally, we recently announced several new encryption enhancement features allowing you to encrypt all new volumes created in your account with a single opt-in setting. This greatly simplifies your internal security pr compliance programs. How does EBS encryption work? EBS encryption is integrated with Amazon KMS. You have the option of using a default customer master key or a custom customer master key to protect your data. Once a volume is enabled for encryption, all data on that volume is encrypted. We encrypt on the hardware power in your instance. And as mentioned earlier with Nitro, we leverage the Nitro card for EBS to ensure that you have no performance impact. This means that your data is encrypted between the instance and the volume and at rest in our storage subsystem. It remains encrypted when you take a snapshot. When that snapshot is copied to another region, and any volumes created from that snapshot also retain the encryption properties. If you build encryption within your instance, some of the CPU that powers your instance will be dedicated to encryption. If you use EBS encryption, we offload the encryption into Nitro hardware, which is capable of delivering the full rated EBS optimized performance. Now it's easy to specify volume encryption when you create the volume. Just check the box, check the box for encrypt this volume. As part of create, you can choose to use the default key or select another master key within your account. Using a custom master key gives you the ability to further audit access and control things like key rotation and access policies. What if you want to ensure all volumes in your account are encrypted? You could create IAM policies that restrict the creation of unencrypted volumes, combined with config rules that detect an alarm on unencrypted volumes. But that's a lot of work. Recently, we launched the ability to enable encryption of all new EBS volumes by default. To set it up, go into your EC2 dashboard and select EBS encryption under the account attributes. Note that this is a regional setting. For this account, it's currently disabled in our Ohio region. After clicking manage, you can select always encrypt new EBS volumes, as well as choose the key, whether it's the default key or a custom key. Once you've updated the policy, any new volume will default to encryption with the selected key. Of course, you can always override the key when you create a new volume. Data security is important. 
And we didn't talk a lot about snapshots, but we did talk a little bit about it. You can learn more in some of the other sessions at reInvent this year. But it is important to remember that snapshots can be shared. Keep track of which snapshots are shared and why, and leverage tags to help. Also ensure that account level volume encryption is enabled. As we come to the end of our session, hopefully it's clear, the features we launch are directly targeted at the key things our customers are asking us for. We continue to lower costs for customers with volumes like GP3. We continue to drive higher performance and reliability for our volumes with new volumes like IO2 Block Express. We continue to improve the ability of customers to scale and manage their EBS resources with features like Elastic Volumes and Fast Snapshot Restore. And we continue to make it easier and simpler to manage EBS securely with features like account level volume encryption. Thanks for your time today and we hope you have a great rest of your day.